Okay, um, so uh, I'm from um, Chapman and Hall, and uh, my name is David Grubbs. Um, I'm a senior editor for statistics. Uh, I'll let the other editors introduce themselves. So my name is Rob Calver. I'm senior publisher for statistics, mathematics, and physics at Chapman and Hall CRC Press, Taylor and Francis. <laughs> I'm Randy Cohen. I'm the publisher for computer science and IT at Chapman and Hall CRC Press. Uh, and I'm Lara. I'm also an editor for statistics uh, at Chapman and Hall CRC Press. Okay, so we'll get started. So um, first of all, we just want to tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, so Chapman Hall is the imprint of CRC Press that specializes in mathematics, statistics, and computer science. Um, uh, we publish 150 new stats and computer science books each year, and we have over 3,000 titles in the backlist. Um, we're inter internationally renowned, especially in statistics and data science. Um, the cornerstones are our green and red books, which you, pro you probably know about. Uh, one's the monograph, uh, one's the textbook series. Uh, we're also very big in bio stats. Um, a lot of the trailblazing work is being done right now is in our R data science machine learning series, and we'll talk a little bit about those. One of the reasons we were especially keen to come and speak with the R ladies is that, um, like you, we love R. Uh, and also we want to increase our diversity. We realize our list is heavily weighted with male authors and we're looking to sign more women and gender minorities as well as authors of color. Um, so we've made some inroads in this area in recent years and we're gonna to speak to you briefly about some of the women who published with us who um, are associated with R. Okay. Yeah, hold on, sorry. Um, While David's working on the technologies, in, interesting factoid about Chapman and Hall is that um, Chapman and Hall actually turned down Charles <laughs> Dickens' A Christmas Carol. So that's one you can share with your friends. We turned down A Christmas Carol back in the uh, 19th century. We did eventually end up publishing it. Chapman and Hall, if you Google it, was famously a publisher of Dickens back in the day, but now we we specialize in statistics and data science, which I'm sure would make Dickens proud if he were <laughs> alive today. Yeah, we um, we started out in 1834. Um, so, can you guys see the next slide? Yeah, yeah. Didn't they say that people wouldn't be interested in Christmas stories, which was a huge mistake? at the time but <laughs> never mind. <laughs> we, we can uh, we can move past that um so in this slide you can see some of the emerging topics and trends um that we are seeing at the moment obviously you can see R at the top there data science programming machine learning but these are by no means uh, the only topics we've published and we're obviously interested in all and any ideas um around the topic of statistics and computer science so these are just some of the of the headlines we're seeing at the moment. Um, and yeah, as David mentioned, we have a number of series um, that we're gonna talk about a little bit more in a moment. We have one with the ASA and that's a little bit less technical and it's a bit more focused on promoting statistical literacy um, and sort of the application of statistics in general. Um, and the journals of the ASA are also published by our parent company, Taylor and Francis. So there's a nice little umbrella there. Next slide, please, David. As David said, we're going to talk a little bit more about a couple of the series that we're working in at the moment. So as you can see here, this is our data science series. Um, the name says it all really. It's a relatively new series for us. It only was conceived in 2019, but it's already extremely active and we already have 13 titles. And we're expecting it to become one of our most active series in the coming years. Uh, it's a collaboration between the statistics and the computer science team. Um, Randy here represents computer science. Um, and yeah, it's really, it's a really interdisciplinary series. Uh, 
to cover the fast moving field of data science. It brings together researchers, practitioners, and instructors from different fields. Um, it covers everything, both introductory topics as well as advanced. So you can have, say, the introduction to data science as well as more um, specialized topics in the series. And yeah, we're expecting it to become one of our most active series in the next in the next years. And the next series is the R series. And whoops, sorry. Um, so um, this series highlights various aspects of R. So it, 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 it does basically does two things. Um, we have um, applications of the other areas to R. So we have like econometrics with R, microeconometrics with R, uh, or data con or, or conservation with R, things like that. And then we also have various aspects of R, like the you know the tidyverse or shiny or um, uh, just um, plotly, uh, just different um, different aspects of R itself. Um, we've got 56 um, published titles. Some of them are textbooks. We've got five to 10 new books each year. And the series editors are Hadley Wickham, John Chambers, Torsten Houthorn, and Duncan Temple Lane. Um, we probably need to talk about adding a woman in there. Um, but uh, those are the current series editors. I'm sure Hadley needs no introduction to any of you. Uh, so the best-selling book in the series is Hadley's uh, Advanced R book. And we just came out with a new uh, I don't know if Rob wants to talk about that new Advanced R Solutions book. Yes, yeah, so a very exciting addition to the series just came out this month, which is uh, Advanced R Solutions, which was so I, I talked to Hadley about this and he said that when he wrote down the exercises for Advanced R, he never intended them for them to be solved. And then these two young graduate students came along and they started trying to solve them. Um, and creating this book, The Advanced Star Solutions, with all the solutions to the exercises in there. And, and Hadley joined as an author, and it's just come out. And it's a really substantial book. It's more than a solutions manual. It is a, um, yeah, a really sort of complement, supplement to Advanced Star. So if any, any of you are fans of that book, then I, I recommend you, you take a look. And as with many of our books, and this is an important point that we'll make throughout, um, we often act as the print partner. You know, we recognize that data science is very much an open science, which is why we're always keen to work with people who want to make their books available in an open way and work with us as the print partner and an ebook partner. Um, and that's true of, of Advanced R Solutions as well. So you can find it. And then if you want the print version, you can come and speak to us. We're not supposed to be promoting our books today, are we? <laughs> promoting the idea of publishing with us. So I'll hand back over. <clears throat> so, and I'm going to speak a little bit about our machine learning series, which is primarily published on the computer science side, but as you can see, we cross over with each other quite a lot and work very closely together across statistics and computer science. Um, so this is a very successful series um, that we started back in um, about 2006, I think. Um, and the series editors are Ralph Herbrick, who was formerly the head of machine learning at Amazon, and he's now moved to a fashion startup, which has been, I think, very exciting for him. Um, and then Tor Grapel is um, at Google DeepMind. Um, so they're very active um, in the machine learning community. Um, the series crosses over, it has a range of topics. Um, it's very introductory in terms of a number of textbooks in the series, introductory textbooks. Um, for example, the machine learning and algorithmic perspective is an intro textbook um, that is one of our best selling books. Um, and you'll see there our first course in machine learning is another intro text. Um, but we also have some very applications oriented reference type books in the series as well. Um, we aim to publish about three to five new books each year in the series. Um, and many of the books, like I said, have been very good sellers and have been very popular books used in courses and also for independent reading and independent study. So next slide. Okay. So uh, now we're going to speak briefly about um, a few of the, the um, women that have published with us. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know you guys are probably more interested in the process. Um, so we're just going to run quickly through these. 
Uh, yes, this is a book that was published in 2015, I think. Um, and it sort of, it covers the role of statisticians as leaders, particularly women in statistics as leaders, but not just in statistics, also in other technical fields. Um, and it covers both sort of the broader issues, but also issues such as leadership within teams, direct project management, etc. And Amanda Goldbeck has also published a different book with us about um, Elizabeth Scott's work at Berkeley. Next slide, please. This is the forthcoming book we're really excited about by Julia Silge and Emil Hivetveld. Um, it's coming out in October. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to see how it's going to be received. It's on supervised machine learning for text analysis in R. And yeah, we're excited uh, to see it come out. And we're excited that Julia is publishing with us. Yeah, one of the things that we uh, were a little worried about when we put the slide in is that you guys would get intimidated that you felt might feel like you needed to be Julia Silge in order to publish with us, which is uh, couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, sometimes we get, you know, these high profile people like Hadley and uh, Julia, but, um, but Rob's going to talk a little bit more about, you know, qualifications to be an author, but just don't feel like you need to, you know, be a Julia Silge mm -hmm. in order to, uh, to publish with us. Okay, this is a neat book that I published. Um, it's called Basketball Data Science with Applications in R. And it's by Paolo Zuccolato and Marika Manzera. And um, they're two women who are based in Brescia, Italy, and um, run a, they're, they're university professors, but they also run a sports analytics group called BD Sports. Um, it's one of the first books um, to talk about um, uh, data science in basketball. Um, they take one season of NBA games and they create a custom R packages uh, that lets you um, run the uh, analysis yourself. Okay, the next one's one that I published, JavaScript for Data Science, which is um, was one of the early books in our R series. So Maya Gans is um, the lead author of that book, and she co-authored it with Toby Hodges and Greg Wilson, who I'm sure many of you might be familiar with. Greg is, is a very uh, prolific author of ours and very active um, in, in the R community. Um, and so Maya was a great author to work with. She um, it was a freelance data scientist, but now she's a um, R and JavaScript developer for a pharmaceutical company in Las Vegas. Muted, David. Dolores Ugarte and Anna Militino are um, uh, professors in Spain, and uh, they wrote this. this is one of the very first um, probability and statistics textbooks at the introductory level to use R, um, and it's been very successful for us. And this is Anita Fall. She is um, the author of this uh, great textbook, A Concise Introduction to Machine Learning, one that we published in our machine learning book series. Um, it's an introductory textbook um, that's designed for graduate and senior undergraduate students. Um, and it's a very popular hands-on book. Um, Anita um, is formerly at the University of Cambridge, but um, she's doing a lot of work right now with the British Antarctic Society. Um, she's a data scientist with them. And so um, this has been a very popular book and it was great working with Anita on it. So we've already gotten a few, um, we've gotten already gotten a few comments. So Eric says he's excited to see the shiny uh, book, which uh, he was a, um, he was a reviewer for. Uh, says, uh, Gwen says that Di Cook could be interested in being an editor for the R series. And uh, Eric really likes the data science with basketball book. So, anyway. Uh, 
Okay, um, Maria Rizzo is another um, one of our sort of our ladies. Uh, she is, um, she's done the second edition of statistical computing with R. Um, it's a textbook um, that is being used in a lot of courses. She's from Bowling Green University. Uh, yes, this is um, one of the books in the series that I mentioned earlier that we publish in collaboration with the ASA. Um, that's sort of a, a bit less technical, less focused on code and a bit more for a general audience. This is by Claire Bowen, who's at the Urban Institute and is forthcoming, is coming out in, um, in November. And it's sort of focusing on the trade-off between privacy laws, but also using data for good and especially big data analysis um, in public policy. So it should be very interesting when it comes out. Yeah. Claire is really visible uh, in the Twitter uh, art community. I'm sure a lot of you have probably come across her. So, um, and she, she's just been uh, bugging us to get some hex stickers. I use hex stickers in my, uh, in my um, advertisements for this, uh, for this uh, talk. And she's like, where are my hex stickers? So, uh, so we have a few more. Um, so, Laura? Yeah, yeah, these are um, a few more of our authors you may be familiar with, um, especially the Blockdown and the R Markdown Cookbound book. Um, and there's also the Textual Data Science with R book that's a little bit older. But yeah, these are some of our books and authors that you may have come across in your work previously. Okay, Rob. Okay, thank you. So I suppose this is the, the key question that we're here to answer today, isn't it? Is why publish a book and why publish it with us? So the first question you might ask yourself is why, why would I work on a book? And so here's some of the, the key things as we see it, you know, from your perspective, is it can be good exposure for your work to publish a book. I'm sure you can think of many people that you know primarily for a book they've written rather than a paper they've written or something else they've done. So it can be really good for name recognition if you publish a book um, you know, a prominent book that does well and people like, then it can be a really good move for your career. It gives you exposure. But more importantly than that, it, it's the impact that it can have on others. So it's about um, if it's a textbook or not even a textbook. A lot of the books we publish in the R and data science series are not textbooks, but people use them to learn how to do things with R, how to do things in data science. And so you can have a real impact on others by sharing your knowledge and experience in that way providing that service to the community. Um, um, the key thing for me, I think, is that it's, it can be a lot of fun to work on a book. We certainly, as editors, uh, Chapman and Hall, have a huge amount of fun working with our authors on projects, helping them to develop them, um, you know, and work on them and, and get them finished, because that can be a big challenge, is managing to do that. So, you know, David asked me to say something about qualifications, and it's a difficult one, because um, I think if you if you feel that there's a contribution that you can make, that you've got something to say, that you've got some knowledge and experience to share, and you can write a bit as well, then you, know, you should speak to us about that because um, there are people like Julia and Hadley who are at you know, the very top of the field who, who write books, but there's also people that maybe aren't so prominent, but um, you know, can really uh, have something to say, can make a contribution to the community and provide that service and share their knowledge with others. So, um, yeah, it's a really- I mean, Hadley, Hadley was a graduate student when he wrote that book. He was, yeah. So I suppose you could say that our, our esteemed former colleague, John Kimmel, uh, who was an editor, trailblazing editor in statistical computing for about 50 years, took a, took a risk on Hadley when he was a graduate student and um, you know started working with him on that book. And literally the rest is history, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure that book had a big impact on Hadley's career. Um, no doubt he would have become a superstar, whatever, um, but it certainly helped him to, you know, to, to start his rise to stardom. So um, we're not all Hadley, admittedly, but I think there's, there's contributions that everyone can make. So if you have an idea, we'll talk more about the process now, but if you had an, have an idea, but you feel nervous about discussing it, don't be, because we'd love to talk to you about it and love to, um, to give you more information beyond what we talk about today on the process. 
Next slide, please. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about sort of taking it forward if you do think you may be interested in writing a book. Um, obviously, the biggest topic is sort of what is the book about? What could be something that you'd, you wanted to write about? And I think in many ways, many of our books come from things where people think a resource is missing or where they've been using something, but they think, oh, there isn't really anything good that I can use for this. Um, either that's a course that they're teaching or something that they're working on with us. Like, ah, it would be really great if there was something on like, fill, fill in blank, basically. So many people actually write the book that they want to read or that they want to work on, um, which can be a great, great place to start. But it can also be something that you've been working on, maybe um, in our package that you've been tinkering away with or something that you've identified um, that you think will be beneficial for others to read. Um, and then you want to go from there to think, OK, who's the book for? Is it for people like me? Do I want to write for students? Um, who could be the potential reader and how could they be best served? And that sort of ties in with, with who's the market for the book? Um, who is there a need in the market? Um, and then that again ties in with what are the competing books? Is mine different? Does it offer a fresh approach? And it's important to say, I think, that you, there's no need to reinvent the wheel if you're writing a book. Often, if you have a fresh approach or a new view on something, that is enough. You don't have to completely come up with a groundbreaking topic that has never been seen before, um, which I think is important to say. And also, your editor can help you with this. So if you come to us and you have a preliminary idea, it doesn't have to be fully formed. Like We can guide you through this and work with you on your idea. And then lastly, you want to think about this is particularly important for our books it's like is there any code that i want to that i want to accompany my books should have solutions sort of have e-resources accompanying website but that's more later down the line i would say yeah i'll pass on to david now who can give you more information okay. once you've shaped your idea okay so um this is uh basically the publishing process um sort of a flow chart for that um so Basically, um, uh, you start work working out with one of us, uh, working with one of us to develop your proposal. Um, and so you've got an idea, you come to us, um, you talk to us, and then we send you a form that you fill out. It's like a two to three page questionnaire um, that where you lay out, you know, the ideas for your proposal. Um, and we have a whole slide on, on um, you know, what should be in the proposal. So I, I will skip over that. But um, once you filled out the form, you submit that in a table of contents. Um, and then we, um, once we decide that it's ready to go um, and that, you know, you've put all the information in there that, that we need, uh, we send the proposal out for peer review. Um, and peer review can sound a little scary, but it's basically just um, we send it to, and in the proposal, there's a place where you can recommend people. So we basically just send it to other people who are doing similar things that, that you were doing. Um, and uh, the process takes two to four weeks and we get the reviews back and then we make a decision. Um, either we offer a contract um, we suggest changes um, or revisions based on the reviews or we, we reject it. Um, you know, I don't know what percentage of rejections we have. I don't think there are that many. I think usually either we're going to offer a contract or we're going to suggest that you go back and make some changes. Um, and... Uh, uh, if those, you know, kind of hurdles are passed, then we'll offer a contract. Um, we also have a slide about that. Um, and then um, you can start the book writing process and you'll be working with a uh, commissioning editor this whole time. Um, usually it takes one to two years to write a book. Um, and we may do some reviewing in, in, um, in that time period period, you might write a few chapters and then we'll get a review. Um, and then eventually you'll submit your manuscript. Um, and then we go into production 
And so production involves um, having the book copy edited um, by someone who is not a technical person. I mean, they don't understand, they're not gonna know, you know, what your equations or your code are, but, um, you know, they'll be able to improve upon the English and the grammar and find typos and things like that. Um, and then, you know, the book appears on our website and on Amazon pre-publication. Um, and then it comes out, it gets published, and then um, that's when we begin marketing it and trying to, um, you know, we sort of activate our worldwide sales force. So David, we have a question in the chat. We have a question. Eric says, I've seen a few of these great books developed in the open. Are there any difficulties getting that approved? Um, are you, are you talking about um, open science? Yeah, having the books um, openly available? Yes. yes. Uh, no. I think are we, the question yes. there is generally about the development of them as well, which we are, um, yeah, we're yes. really keen to, to back up our authors in doing that because we think it's tremendously beneficial to the project to go through that process. So often authors want to have the book available via the generally via the book down website from early on in the process so that people can read it give them feedback and help them to develop it and, and we think that's a wonderful thing because we try to do our own reviewing which is important because we do blind peer review which enables people to perhaps be more critical than they might be in an open review process um, but just getting as many people to read it as possible before publication is really important to help you develop the book into the best book it can be. So yeah, we, we absolutely, no trouble at all getting that approved, you know, because we all think it's crucially important to making sure that these books- that Rob's actually the one who approves them. Well, um, that's true, yes, <laughs> so, so that is true. So I can, and Randy is, so I think- And I, Randy, I, yes. I, yeah, I will always approve such a thing because I think it's, um, yeah, it, it makes such a difference to these books to develop in that, them in that way. And to build interest in them early on, which is, I think, you know, a crucial factor as well. Shall I take over from here, David? Do you want to move on to the next slide? And I'll talk yeah. a bit more about preparing a proposal. So David and Lara already touched on this a bit. So you've, you've got this idea, you've already shaped it. Um, you've thought about all those things which are important to think about in advance. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You do want to have something that's a little bit different. You've looked at the other books that are out there. Maybe you've been inspired to write the book in the first place because you've tried using some other books that didn't work for you. You have a slightly different perspective on teaching some topic or you know, the way something is done. So you really feel like you, you're ready to prepare a proposal. Now, um, the, I think what I always say to potential new authors at, at this point is that it's a really good process to go through. Even at the end of the day, you decide not to move forward with the project because there's no commitment at this stage. We ask you to pre prepare a proposal. We put it to peer review, assuming a positive response, as David said before, then we would be looking to offer you a contract and work with you on the book. But it's only at that point when you've signed the contract that you're committed to it. But this process of actually developing a proposal, writing down the audience, the synopsis of the book, so your motivation for working on it, the aims and scope, the key features, all of these things, um, can be a really good process to go through to make you think, oh, is this something I want to do? It's a big undertaking taking on a book project. So actually doing this can help you to, to work out if it's something you really have the time and energy to work on and will be useful. Um, so I always say the first point is the, is the table of contents. You write down the outline of what you think the book will look like. Um, we like to see quite a bit of detail here. So either chapter subheadings or an abstract to describe the aims and scope of each individual chapter. In the proposal form, you'd also say something about the technical aspects of the, the project. So the time scale to completion, which as David said, can be, you know, the, the average book is around one to two years, um, but it, it can be quicker if a lot of material is in place already. It can be much longer because we've all worked on projects that have taken years to complete, I'm sure. Um, we're very flexible on the formatting. We much, much prefer nowadays LaTeX or Bookdown. Some authors still like to write in Word and that's absolutely fine. We can take Word and convert it into our format as well. Um, so yeah, so 
don't be afraid to fill in the proposal form and to run it by us. We'll send for review um, if we think it's ready for that um, and get some feedback. And you never know what often happens is an author is unsure then they get all the reviews which say, this is a wonderful project. This is the person to do it. This is gonna be great. I want this book on my shelf. And that can be a good motivator to sort of make you think that it's worth moving forward with the project. Okay. We have three questions. I don't know if we should answer them now or hold them until the end. What do you guys think? Should we look at them at the end? I think it would be better to run through it Okay. Yeah, I'll write them down. Okay. Okay, what's in a contract? Yes, so um, once you decided that you want to move forward with the project, um, as Rob said, we'll sign a contract. And the contract basically sets out the parameters of the project um, just to make it official, both sort of what we will do and what we expect the project to look like. So an approximate page count, a number of figures, a due date, um, the format, so will it be LaTeX, book down a word, uh, what happens to the copyright, how many author copies there will be, any other special terms that might be covered, um, and the royalties. Um, and as it says here, the royalties can be donated to charity, so you don't, they don't have to go to you. Um, and quite a few authors choose to donate their, royal their royalties either to charity or another course of your choosing. I believe we have a couple of authors that donate their royalties to our ladies in fact so if that's something you want to do that's a possibility um but yes so basically that's the contract in a nutshell thanks Lara. okay so book down um so um uh, we, we were at the jsm uh maybe two or three years ago and every author that was coming to us was saying they wanted to work in Booktown. And it was that point that we sort of realized that um, this was something that we were going to have to um, either, either fight against or go with the tide. So we decided to go with the, the, the direction that the open science community is, is going and to, um, to be freely open and to let our authors leave their book down books up freely available. Uh, we do ask that they don't, uh, they, they give credit to us and they don't allow downloads. Um, but then we published the parallel print and the e-versions. Um, and so, and we have instructions on how they can use our style files and, our, and convert their book down book into LaTeX. Um, and uh, so I, we find that this kind of is the best of both worlds because the author um, gets to um, have their book openly available, but they also get sort of the credibility that comes with uh, working with a commercial publisher. Plus they also get, um, you know, your book will, will get into a lot of libraries and library ebook collections and things like that that it wouldn't if it were just openly available okay author support that one's real that's, that's me right so i mean we've talked about a lot of these things already to be honest so um, you know, this is the this is the value we really add to your project. We try to offer you as much as support as possible throughout the whole process to help you make your book happen effectively, because that's the first hump to get over is actually um, moving forward with a project and then seeing it through to completion, because it is a major undertaking. But we are there throughout the process. You have a dedicated editor, probably in most cases, it'll be one of the four of us or one or two of our colleagues are also publishing books in this field as well. Um, and we're there the whole way through helping with the peer review process, which we which we have at various stages. Um, so we have that initial proposal review. We also recommend um, you having as many friends and colleagues read it as possible and that we also conduct some further reviewing of the manuscript down the line. And just to comment on this, actually, because David did mention this earlier, the review process for a book is very different to that of a journal article. So if, if I'm sure many of you have published lots of journal articles and have maybe had the experience of what can be sometimes a very brutal review process 
um, you know, either with a with a rejection after six after six months of reviewing or twelve months of reviewing, or you know, very strict changes required of a paper. That's not quite what we do here. You know, we're working with our authors to to make the books as as good as they can be by trying to generate as much constructive feedback as we can to help them develop their books into really good books, you know, make them appropriate for the market and covering all the bases that are needed. We also have the production support you'd expect. So we've got very good in-house latex support. We're not experts in book down, I'll be honest about that, but what we do have now is uh, just a dozens, if not hundreds of our authors who've experienced now in um, producing their books in, in book down and, and giving it to us such that we can print from it. Uh, one of the advantages of working with us in that respect is that EYZ is an author of ours. So he's actually built everything into book down so that you can output directly into our format um, and it all works quite smoothly. Um, and then as David mentioned, once the book's in production, we do the copy editing you'd expect. We help if needed to get it into a perfect format for printing. And then we handle all of that part of the process at no cost to the author so this is a really key point we bear all the costs of the development and production of the book um, and pay the authors a royalty based on the income from that book so you know many publishers will look maybe for a payment in advance um, that's not how it works with us you know we are a, a proper commercial publisher um, and that's you know, how it's structured in terms of the financial aspects. Okay. So why publish with CRC? Um, so uh, like I mentioned, um, you get a certain amount of credibility um, if you can say that your book was published with Chapman and Hall as opposed to simply having it open source. Um, you'll get international sales and exposure um, we're the leading publisher in statistics and data science. Um, we've already talked about the peer review and how we support open science. Um, you'll get one-on-one -on -one attention from uh, each one of us. Um, I, I'll speak for myself, but I think it's probably true of the rest of us that if you write one of us, you'll get a reply pretty much, pretty much very shortly thereafter. We um, are very, very attentive to our authors and, um, uh, you know, if one of them writes us um, or sends us some pages to look at, we get back to them quite quickly. Uh, we do do copy editing, production support, Lake Tech Help Desk. Um, yeah, and you'll be joining a world-renowned community of authors. Um, you'll get social media exposure and, of course, uh, we'll be showing your books at conferences once they return. Rob is uh, sitting um, in, in the remnants of a, uh, a JSM booth that shows what the world used to look like when we um, were able to attend conferences and display our books, but um, we hope to get back there uh, soon. Okay. And here's our contact information uh, for Laura, me, Randy, and Rob. And this is the Chicago group. And any questions? We have three in the chat. So um, mm -hmm. first one is, does publishing an open version impact author compensation in any way? And I, the answer to that really is we believe anecdotally because I don't think we've really dug into the data it's quite hard to do so that having that open version can really boost the success of the book um, we we don't necessarily think that it erodes the sales that's our view at this point um, so therefore you know the compensation doesn't change because you, you know we don't offer you less royalties because you want an open version um, it's you know pretty much a standard offer um, and we would hope that that open version would boost the impact and sales of the book. To what extent do you market the books in the R series as required textbooks for graduate or undergraduate courses? Shall I take that one as well? So if the books in the series are written and designed as textbooks, 
um, with exercises and all the ped pedagogical features you'd expect, and they're aimed at certain courses, then we would um, include them in all the textbook marketing and sales efforts that we do for any you know standard textbook. So I, get, I, think, I think a good example of that would be a book that David referenced earlier by Maria Rizzo, which is a very successful textbook on statistical computing used in a lot of different schools. And so we, you know, it's marketed um, you know, very much in the same way as all of our other textbooks. And then the last, oh, there's a couple more. So I was speaking with the head of the department of a department where I will probably apply for an academic job. And he said that no one pays you to write a book. Is that true? What are your views? This is a soft money position, so it's important for them. Now, this is always a difficult question. And my answer, which I'm sure is similar to the other editors on the call here, is that you're not going to make a huge amount of money from publishing an academic book. You know, in, in, in R and data science, the market is good because it's a really engaged, large growing community of people who are interested in our books. And we do sell a lot of copies, but um, you know, it's not necessarily a substantial income. Maybe it will pay for a nice holiday every year, perhaps look at it that way. Um, so yes, it can be challenging if you're in a soft money position um, writing a book maybe, you know, doesn't necessarily have the income that your department will be looking for. So oftentimes our authors will be writing on their personal time. Um, so it, it needs to be something that is, is the right thing for your career to take that time that's needed to write the book um, and the impact it has on your career is the positive thing. From personal experience, having an open version actually encouraged me to buy a printed copy to show my support. That's exactly, yeah, that's exactly our feeling as well, that um, it, it's still the case that people look at the open version um, and, you know, get a feel for the book and like it. But then, I don't know, I guess you all know better than us, but I think people still like to have the physical copy of the book to have on their desk. They find it easier for referencing um whilst they're working on the computer in r so i think it you know they very much go hand in hand as parallel versions of the book and people like to own both okay and that's all the questions on the chat um i just wanted to someone actually sent me a direct message but i think it was supposed to go to everyone um uh, it's from Joyce who asked a question about marketing the book for uh, academic classrooms, and she says, and to follow up on my question, would it be considered a plus to include exercises at the end of ends of chapters? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, certainly if the book is, is designed as a textbook, then we would expect to see exercises, because if you want your book used as a textbook, on courses, then I think um, exercises are a requisite. It can also be useful for you know the, the non-textbook reference practitioner books that you often see in the R and data science series um, that people will include a smaller number of exercises in chapters in the same way as I described earlier that Hadley did with advanced R um, with the idea being to set exercises that people can use to kind of you know, enhance their understanding of what was discussed in the chapter. So that was always his intention with the exercises in that book. And now, of course, we have the solutions, which is why that solutions book has kind of extended the book so much. It's not just answers to the questions. It's actually a whole new book in its own right, which takes things further and so on. So that can be a good way to use exercises in a book on R or data science. Any other questions? So Eric asks, are there any specific domains you are looking for more proposals about? Now that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, we have a, a large and growing list in R and data science now. Um, and it's such a broad and diverse subject area that that's quite a difficult question to answer. I suppose we're always looking for our authors to drive this in some respects, to come to us with their ideas, um, you know, things they're doing that they think might be of interest to people. Um, and then we, you know, we can talk, talk with them about that and 
talk in more detail about the process we've just discussed here um, and take it from there. How do you find reviewers when it's a fairly small area? A, top, a topic some of us are thinking about writing on is small and has no good sources, hence the need for a book. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question, isn't it? Because that's always something that we are you know, looking at with every project is it might be a very niche topic um, that's maybe got a relatively small market, but it's, it's really important and growing. And sometimes the biggest impact that a book has is to help grow that, you know, bring people into an otherwise small field because there's no way to otherwise to access it. Um, so finding reviewers, we can always find reviewers. We've got so many people that we know in this field now that even if they don't know that particular area, they might you know, be able to say something about it. Or we've got lots of great you know, databases that we can use to find people who are working in the field and, and find reviewers. So, and if nothing else, we can, we can uh, throw it up on Twitter. And absolutely, say, yep, yep, this is true. Uh, and our series uh, advisors do help us too. We have series point. advisors, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we'll put, um, put a book topic up on Twitter and ask for reviewers. And we'd also ask you as well. So, you know, we, part of the proposal form is to write down some suggestions of potential reviewers um, who could give some comments on it. So we, we will contact those people as well. The questions are flying in now. Look at this. <laughs> what do you think of as the widely known and easy to talk about differences between you and other academic publishers, if any? Right. <laughs> There's lots of fantastic publishers out there um, in this area. We're good friends with many of the editors working at other publishers. Um, we like to think of ourselves as the, you know, without blowing our trumpet too hard, as the leading publisher in the field. Um, you know, we've got a fantastic list. We work with some fantastic people. And I think that's what you you know the key thing you get from working with us is being part of that community and that's what we've tried to build I suppose between me and David we've been here now for 17 years working on this list and we've tried to build that sort of community spirit amongst our authors and series editors and it's a great group to join for a new author I think there's lots of authors in that group who can help um, you know to help help you with the technical aspects and to push you along and I think that's something that really sets us apart from, you know, from other publishers, as well as having, you know, all the things you'd expect from a large commercial publisher, very strong sales and distribution, you know, excellent marketing and production support. Um, we, we're very good at reaching lots of growing markets, you know, so we have sales force forces that reach all across Asia and Africa and the Middle East, as well, of course, as the US, UK and, and mainland Europe. So, uh, you know, it, it, in terms of getting the widest reach, I don't think there's many, you know, better options than us in terms of academic publishers. Although that's we're just my really, opinion, of course. And we're all really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would also that's say true. if you know any colleagues that we've mentioned um, in the presentation or that you've that published with us, just ask them because I, I think for the most part, most of our authors have had good experiences working with us and they can guide you, you know, if you, if you have colleagues that have published before, they can guide you on, you know, what, what they found to be pitfalls or troubles or what their experiences were. Um, hopefully most of them were positive. Yeah, I think uh, one difference, I mean, I don't know. Um, I think um, most of the other publishers are still um, resistant to having um, books openly available. Um, so I would say that is one difference between us and um, some of the other publishers. Some of them um, are not that keen on having their books openly available. Um, so um, I think our sort of embrace of that position is probably um, a strong difference uh, between us and, and some of the other publishers. Also, I think as far as pricing, um, we really are trying to still sell to individuals, um, whereas some of the other publishers are much more keen on selling to libraries, so you'll see much higher prices. Hmm. 
We're also quite big on Twitter nowadays, aren't we, David, which is a good thing. Speaking of wide reach, do you support translation as something doing well in English to broaden the audience? We do. We, we don't publish in foreign languages, but we have an excellent rights department that is constantly reaching out to um, foreign language publishers um, with the idea of seeing our books translated into other languages. So um, that's something we can definitely support with. So if you, for example, were particularly keen to publish a book with us, but also in your native language or you know some other language that you're particularly interested in, we can actively try and make that happen. Mm. Seeing many respected members of the R community working with you definitely speaks to someone like me. Yeah, well, thank you, Eric. Yeah, we we you know we we definitely hope that our you know the authors we have kind of is you know all the recommendation we need to be honest you know they're the they're the important people in the process and um yeah we love working with them and you know it's great that they are part of you know our author community mm. joyce says i've reviewed proposals and manuscripts for crc press a few times and it has always been a very positive experience with tremendous respects for the author and reviewers thank you joyce that's very kind of you to say and and that speaks to what we what we said before that the review process is not about you know, critiquing and, you know, trying to make you feel bad about your idea. It's about seeing if we can work it into something that's going to be publishable and it's going to be you know, have an impact. Um, so it's about, you know, we're very constructive in our reviewing processes. Mm. I guess we're out of time, are we? Do we? There's no more questions coming in on the chat, Emily. So I don't know if. Well, um, I'm I've actually uh, in charge of closing today. So um, I just wanted to say thank you so, so, so much for coming. And um, I have a very, very unrelated question. And that is uh, so I, you know, I, I really miss seeing people face to face. And uh, one of the things that happened to me today in one of my labs with a collaborator is I got to see two of people next to each other and I could finally tell who was taller. So I just wondered if you could tell us in order of height, who is tallest to shortest out of our four presenters? Because that is just something I'm really curious about. And it's something we miss so much of being online. I only get to see this much of you. So could you please let us know? <laughs> I think you know. I'm the shortest, probably. <laughs> I don't know, Laura. You're taller than me, I think. <laughs> think Randy, so, maybe. I don't Randy know. is definitely the shortest. Yes. <laughs> right, David, you're taller than me, right? By about half an inch. You're muted as you're muted. well. It doesn't help. <laughs> no, it's still you're muted. muted. <laughs> Oh, and we have just one last question that's that yeah, is related do. to the topic, and that is about um, Eastern or Asian editions that are more accessible price slot wise. So we don't publish um, different editions of our books that are quote unquote Eastern or, or Asian. Um, but what we do have, as I mentioned before, is very strong sales force that reaches into those markets and then does lower price deals on a case-by-case -case basis to try and make our books more accessible for those markets. So let's say, for example, that we're pricing a book for our primary US, UK market to say $80. That wouldn't necessarily be the price that people, um, say people using it for a course in India or you know, other parts of Asia might be paying. But those deals are very much done on a bespoke case by case basis, rather than us having an explicit Asian edition of the book available. Uh, we do do Indian editions. Um, our Indian office will sometimes do an Indian edition at a lower Yes. Price. Yeah. So they, they are individual deals that are being done on the books to sell them into india so if somebody in india is using one of our books for a course then it would be done on a case-by-case -case basis that maybe it's 300 copies at 10 or 15 dollars a copy rather than 80. 
Um, but that's very much case by case. But as the key thing is that we are, you know, perhaps better than any other academic publisher at reaching those markets and making our books accessible for them. Um, it's just not, you know, you wouldn't necessarily see it as an on Amazon available at that price. So I have a question for the audience. I mean, uh, uh, Stephanie's already said that she has an idea for a book, but I'm just curious how many of you are, have thought about doing a book? I don't think anybody can answer, can they? <laughs> oh, we've got at least, oh, look at this. Ah, look at this. Well, this is, I mean, this is the key thing for us to close with, I suppose, is that- So we've um, got three, don't three, be scared four, to contact us. four ideas yeah. already. That's brilliant, yeah. So Five. our contact details are there on the last slide. So everybody on here, whether you've got an idea or not, please get in touch. Um, you know, because we can always add you to our reviewer database so you can see the other side of the process as well, um, reviewing proposals for us, which can often be useful if you're then you know, looking to propose a book yourself is to see it from that perspective. Because that's one thing I meant to say earlier, actually, is think of yourself when writing the proposal as a reviewer of it. You know, so you're trying to make it um, make that reviewer understand what you're trying to do. So, yeah, please send us your ideas. Um, get in touch. And we'd love to hear from you. Feedback on the books, we always appreciate that as well. Yeah, or if you have any feedback on the presentation, um, things we can improve, that we would also be glad to hear that. Absolutely. So we decided you're the tallest, David. I think so. I slightly, maybe. <laughs> I think you and I are of similar height. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Okay, so I, I don't think we have any other late breaking questions. I just wanted to say thank you to the four of you. We have really, really appreciated it. And um, I, another thing I wanna say is that we, I really appreciate personally, and I think all of us do, your um, commitment to reaching out to us to find some diverse authors and, um, and also people of color. That's really admirable. And, and it's very in line with, with our mission as our ladies. And also I think that our community as a whole so thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, this conversation will continue and um, hopefully you'll have some more slides with some, some more our ladies uh, in, that you can add to your presentation uh, as, as, it, as, as, um, as, it, as it grows. Um, 